Ashanti Region Police moves to investigate the robbery incident at Santasi Kokobin that led to the death of a private security guard. I was told this morning that robbers have broken into my shop. When they called me, I told them to call the police. The gates had been opened when we got in. My security man had been killed and dragged inside the office. Bring you details as we focus on some of the gruesome crimes recorded in the Ashanti region this year alone and speak to a security analyst. Also, Ghana's legal education system on public trial as calls increase for a total overhaul of the General Legal Council and the administration of the Ghana School of Law. We are actually taking steps to make sure that we can decouple the General Legal Council from the Board of I mean, Legal Education to make sure that law school is deregulated. But will that happen? We have details as aggrieved law students demonstrate to demand the admission of the extra 499 students who obtained 50 plus in the exam 2021. We'll bring you details also on our Clean Ghana campaign, Pork Lovers, please gather around. Where do you get it from? Well, hopefully not from this degree, uh, the Kamara Market in Manprobi, where the Clean Ghana campaign discovered that it is operating illegally for over 30 years. Residential premises, and they, this is the pitch star. Less than 10 meters. You see, so this person will have problem. All of them here, they will feel the stench from this uh, pitch star. And this pista have been there for some time now, which is not supposed to be there. Also here on Join News Prime, Nima's rugby girls will introduce to you the Zongo girls who have set the goal to be Ghana's first female rugby team. I wish to go far in rugby, we travel to countries, we go, we play, we score, we win a Trophy. When I tell people that like, I play rugby league, they'll be like, ah, first girl like you are playing rugby. And later in business, Ghana Cocoa Board, together with National Pensions Regulatory Authority, inaugurates the Board of Trustees for the Cocoa Farmers Pension Scheme. Employment Minister Ignacio Balfour has this mandate for them. You are supposed to be independent. I don't want a situation where tomorrow, we get up and there's a big tug of war between you and the sponsor of the scheme. We have details of these and more here on Join News Prime, coming to you live from our Fund of Fast Studios at Kukumlemli Accra. We are live on DSTV Channel 421, Go TV 144. This is your home of independent, fearless, credible and impactful journalism. I am Ernest Milo. Stay tuned for details. Hello again, many thanks for joining us. Now, the Ashanti region police have moved to Santasi Kokobin to investigate the robbery incident uh, that led to the death of a private security guard. This is the latest in the series of robbery incidents and gruesome murders in the region. We'll bring you more on this particular story shortly. But first, let's take a look at a catalogue of incidents reported uh, from the Ashanti region this year alone. And so in the month of February this year, uh, we had an incident of a financial service firm that CSSL Enterprise being robbed at Bochrom Estate Junction in Kumasi. The suspect, we, it was a robbery gang that carried out this incident and the impact of this attack was that a staff of the company Collins Dapa sustained severe injuries from gunshots uh, during the incident. He later died sadly uh, we do not have an update on this story. Now it, later in June two gold dealers were shot and robbed of their gold and money at Manso uh, Mosikrom in the Amansia South District uh, for a gold heist. Uh, also, the suspect in this incident, four suspected robbers. Um, of course, obviously, uh, this was uh, a blow to the gold dealer. The police moved in to quell the situation, but we do not have an update on, on, on the story yet. Then later in June, Resident of uh, the acting chief of uh, Mansoon Tontokrom was attacked with guns and machete. This was carried out by irate youth. 
uh, in the month of June. Now, later in the month of July, uh, we reported the incident of a decapitated body found at uh, Feyase. Now, the man was identified as Israel Ajay Menu, and he was said to be an Uber driver and a head teacher of a private school in Tonsu. And so, this is what happened in July. Uh, still in July, uh, we had an incident of a 24-year-old Angelina Juma attacked uh, at uh, Maxima Junction in Kumasi. Uh, this was carried out by armed robbers. Uh, she was shot and killed uh, in that very incident in July. Now, in the month of September, we brought you the story of a final year student of Opon Memorial, SHS Richard Apia, uh, who was stabbed. My colleague Ohimenteria uh, followed up on this story for us. This was carried out by some youth of the Kokofu Township. And of course, this led to the death of a student there. Uh, the update we have on this story is that three teenagers have been arrested uh, in connection with the murder. And later, of course, in this month of October, we brought you the story of a Tonsu branch of the Adansi Rural Bank in Kumasi being attacked. This was carried out by armed robbers. And we know that a 37-year-old uh, private security, Alex Opon 24, was shot in that particular incident. He was later found dead, uh, sadly, uh, the following morning with his hands and legs tied behind him. Also in the month of October, uh, this incident, uh, a man was attacked by three people in two days um, after he saw his best friend dating his fiancée in a dream. And, and this was a story that got uh, many of you worried. One of the three died after enduring pains from machete wounds. This was carried out by a 47-year-old man, uh, Kwejo Eduse. And also still in this month, uh, we brought you the story. This was just uh, last week, a story of a pregnant woman, uh, you know, at Nyanchenyase, uh, who stabbed multiple times, who was stabbed multiple times by his husband in the presence of their six-year-old son. And of course, the suspect here, a 44-year-old Maxo Buedu, and um, he has been arrested by the police. This incident, of course, led to the death of the uh, pregnant woman. And then the very final story we brought to you uh, this month, also a woman inflicted with machete wounds uh, in the head and lower abdomen of her son in the presence of uh, three other children. Of course, the victim identified as a 30-year-old Hannah Ikia Efriye. This led to the death of the... Uh, victim the suspect rather is hannah and the, this incident led to the death of the victim and we know that uh, there have been some arrests made and the suspect has been referred to the Ankafo uh, psychiatric hospital for assessment so uh, these are the stories we brought to you in the ashanti region as far as uh, murders and also uh, criminal uh, incidents are concerned. The latest is the Santase Kokobin incident. And the night security guard, 49 year old Busompe Ando, was found with stab wounds and his hands tied behind him at his duty post. The robbers are alleged to have bolted with a cache of 97,000 CDs and a power generator from two shops they robbed. Irasta Sari Donko has more in this report. The late Ando Bosompim washed vehicles in the day and worked as a night security man. I've worked with him for 10 years. We've all been here washing vehicles. We understand that when they came in this morning, this iron garage gate had been broken and was suspended up here. The door has also been forcibly opened. You could see blood on the f uh, floor in front of the shop here, uh, signaling that they might have killed him in front of the shop and dragged him inside the shop because the body was found lying in here with blood spread all over the floor of the shop here. Oti Steven is manager of A2 Enterprise, dealers in aluminium products. I was told this morning that robbers have broken into my shop. When they called me, I told them to call the police. The gates had been opened when we got in. My security man had been killed and dragged inside the office. He was lying in this pool of blood. They took away a safe containing money and a power generator. But when they found him, his hands had been tied 
with a piece of cloth, which is lying in front here. And then he had been gagged in the mouth with a scarf, which is also lying here with blood on it. And there was blood all over the floor, as you can see right now. So the body was lying over here. Upstairs, the suspected robbers are alleged to have broken into this private ECG and Ghana water vending shop and made away with 8,000 cities. Maxwell Menu is the attendant here. They stole monies valued at 8,000 cities. They include ECG and Ghana water funds stored in these drawers. <laughs> This is what we have gathered so far. The police have been here. They've taken the body away and investigations have begun. Reporting for Joy News, Erastus Asaridonko, Kumasi. Let's speak to a security analyst, Adam Buna. He joins us live via Zoom. Mr. Buna, thank you for joining us here on Joy News Prime. So the crimes we catalogued uh, tell a story of violent crimes being perpetrated by armed men or gangs and then the gruesome murders that are domestic in nature. Uh, what's your take on these incidents and the approach of the police? Oh, yeah. Good evening, uh, Ernest, and good evening to your viewers. Well, you see, uh, the crimes were catalogued. Uh, I'm looking at them from two different, you know, angles. You have those that are grouped under, call them, you know, domestic violence, where, uh, you know, uh, persons are killed by persons who know them or persons who are closely related to them. Uh, you, you, there is one, a mother uh, returned from church and butchering the son, uh, a friend going, you know, sleeping and dreaming that somebody was sleeping with the wife and killing, you know, the friend and, you know, a husband killing the wife. There's been a series of distances. So you, you, I, will, I will categorize those ones into one pot. Uh, in that particular pot, it is very difficult to, uh, you know, and I believe in all of these cases, the police have apprehended uh, the suspected, you know, uh, murderers, those who are suspected to have killed these persons. Mm. It is something that is difficult to prevent. The police would not be able to prevent it apart from arresting persons who are involved. The other way of preventing it would be a coordinated effort between the police research unit. Some okay. of us have advocated that the police has, you know, a research unit which is headed by, you know, a senior police officer. Uh, my take on this is that some of these people might have uh, some, you know, uh, psychological uh, challenges and therefore would need some uh, rehabilitation. Some of them are committing these crimes because a preacher man, you know, told them somebody is after them. But until such a time that the police is able to, you know, collect data. How did this person die? Maybe data 20 years, you know, uh, you know, uh, away till today. How these murders have taken place, domestic, domestic violence, that, lead, that led to people dying. Who are the people involved? What okay. gender are they? What age category do they belong to? What is their level of education? We need to know all this. It helps to target the kind of preventative measures that must be put in place. But as we speak, I believe that the new police administration, as we have started well, would have to take a look again at their research unit. Then mm -hmm. the other part has to deal with the, you know, call them the pure uh, robbery, violent robbery that has led to people dying. I say that majority of it has to do with probably the way culturally we have lived. Okay. We have lived culturally as a people who have been brought up to carry cash. So you go into a shop and you want to go and buy produce. 
you are carrying 50,000 Ghana cities, and the shop attendants would willingly take the 50,000 Ghana cities from you without asking questions. Mm -hmm. You are bringing me 50,000 around 5.30 when I'm about closing. When you know the money cannot, I cannot be taken to back, I would have to leave it here or carry it home or transit the money home. And in all these processes, I might be robbed and I could die. Mm. People willingly take the money. And I say it is culturally uh, self-inflicted. Okay. I have advocated that. Why can't most of the shops, if you notice, the young man who died, uh, you know, they robbed two places. One day, according to sources, your report, they had almost 100,000 Ghana cities. Mm. The, the ECG vending shop, they had 8,000 Ghana cities. And according to the owner of the ECG vending shop, they did not touch the computers and all that. And, and, and so you think place. that we should change our approach to business, our approach to life? Uh, that will be and, a solution. But how should the police tackle it, especially when it comes to the banks? So we have seen that uh, timelines to provide armored vehicles, for instance, have not been heeded. Well, they haven't been heeded because some of us kept, uh, you know, talking about these things. Fortunately, like I did mention, there's a new police administration headed by Dampari, the Kufu Dampari, and you can see they've already, you know, outdoored the horse unit, you know, the, the mounted squadron who are in town. I saw them today, and they've outdoored again the K-9 unit. K-9 mm -hmm. unit is a very important segment of crime fighting in every country because the K-9s are able, when trained with the handling, are able to detect firearms, mini ammunition, they are able to detect drugs, they are even trained to detect those who are carrying mm -hmm. probably stolen money and all that. Okay, and but, so but Mr. That Bonner, you talked about... To really look at you, you talked about right. preventive policing uh, in the earlier instance, especially those that have to do with the domestic ones. Uh, would, would it be within the purview of the, uh, would the police be acting within the remit of the law? Uh, should they, you know, address issues, moving to address issues that, for instance, border on the psyche of the people? Does this find expression in the national security strategy? Yes, there is, there is a portion like that, the national security strategy, but it is not very detailed. Obviously, the document... Uh, is work in progress, so but it's not very detailed. It is because of lack of data. If there is enough data collected by the various security agencies, that would inform how what the strategy would look like in the national security strategic policy document. Okay. And so, as far as I'm concerned, the police it's also a part of policing to mm. ensure that the people, you know, psychologically feel okay. Psychologically, they won't harm themselves. Very and well. some of, I, I think. They are working with the Ghana Psychological Association. Mm -hmm. In the past, they have given them some assistance here and there. And so I think it calls for some, you know, uh, coordinated effort at ensuring that at the various district police commands, they would, you know, increase the effort at, you know, Very trying right. to get people first hand counseling. And also regional commanders. Some mm -hmm. regional commanders are not doing well. And so... I'm sure in the next coming weeks, some of us are going to start mentioning them by name. Those Very well. So leadership at the all the levels to address this. Mr. Bona, I'm grateful that you could join us here on Join News Prime. That's a security analyst, Adam Bona, on the crimes we have witnessed in the Ashanti region. Away from that, Ghana's legal education system is on a public trial as calls increase for a total overhaul of the General Legal Council and the administration of the Ghana School of Law. This follows the admission of just 790 out of the 2,834 candidates who sat this year's entrance exam, even though an extra 499 of them secured the 50% pass mark. The aggrieved student Wednesday presented a petition to Parliament and the presidency demanding an intervention to get them admitted. Manuel Quarantin was with them in our reports. The low turnout at the Independence Square on what was to be a Red Wednesday for their aggrieved law students did not discourage them from embarking on their protest. After close to three hours of delay, the protesters hit the street. Their call for the 499 students denied access into the law school after securing 50% pass mark to be admitted. Because I'm for, part of the 499 that have been unjustly denied admission this year and I'm walking to the president's office, we demand that we be heard we demand that they make reforms. We demand that they improve the quality of legal education in Ghana. We deserve it. It's the least we deserve. This, this year, the dynamics is different. This one is, we have written exams and we have passed. 
per the rule of the game, per the established practice, we wrote the exams and passed. So this is a very different case. I'm told we have to have uh, get 50% of the section A and 50% of the section B, which was never so and has never been so. There is no professional exam that you write that you segregate the the, the scores and give them different scores, different uh, weights. It has never happened. Now 57, I am here fighting for my right. Someone had 50 and is in there and is being asked to register and start law school. It's because, is it because my mother is a charcoal seller? Go to defend forever the cause of freedom and of right. Interspersed with chants of patriotic songs, they march to Parliament House with their petition. After some back and forth with the security, just six reps of the aggrieved students have been allowed into the yard to present a petition to Parliament. Accepting the petition on behalf of the Speaker, Minority Leader Harun Aidu's call for the establishment of an independent commission to review the legal education system in Ghana. Let me use this opportunity to call on President Nana Adudanko Akufuado, the President of the Republic, to without any hesitation and as a matter of agency to constitute a legal education reform commission. However, if he fails to do that, we still can use our legislative mandate and authority to get such a commission for it. If the LI and the Supreme Court ruling are not serving the interests of persons wanting to acquire legal education and legal training as professional lawyers, we need to examine the ruling against the law and make a purposeful decision that allows you access to quality legal education. But for Deputy Ranking Member on Parliament's Constitutional, Legal and Parliamentary Affairs Committee, Francis Xavier Susu, it is time for something more drastic. Clearly the law school is not showing leadership. If, if these were some minister of state that failed two years ago, and failed a year ago, and failed now, that minister of state must resign. As we speak now, the director of law school must be resigning. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. The director of law school must be resigning. The general legal counsel, for the fact that they have not been able to manage this situation, the council must be dissolved. From parliament, the protesters headed for the presidency. After a little hold up due to prior arrangement with the police, the students were allowed to present their petition. Emmanuel Kumsen is Deputy Chief of Staff in charge of operations. Them in some way, or we can only impress upon them to reconsider some of the fees. But to think out with the way they operate the thing might also be um, uh, creating a problem by solving another one. So as best as we can, we shall let the AG come out with some proposals or some modalities so that when they meet at the GLC level, they may be able to consider these things and hopefully the issues that are affecting not only the 499 students, but the repeat students and the rest will be dealt with holistically and will not return to these issues again. But were the students satisfied by the responses they got? Well, Parliament, yes. Presidency, I, I was not so satisfied because of one of the issues that I've given you, for example. Like they would not like to interfere. Two petitions in all have been presented to Parliament and of course to the Presidency. The students say they are awaiting immediate action from the powers that be to correct what they call ills in legal education in Ghana. From the Jubilee House here in Accra, my name is Manuel Kranting for Joy News. On a Joy Clean Ghana campaign, AME officials stormed a pigsty operating illegally at Kamara. In the Ablikmo South District. For 30 years, residents in the area have had to endure the stench emanating from the sty in their vicinity, but lacked courage to report their owners due to family ties. My colleague Judith Awatre Tando was with the team and reports owners are now being processed for court. This is a residential premises, and this is the pit stop. Less than 10 meters. You see, so this person will have problem. All of them here, they will feel the stench from this uh, pig star. And this pig star has been there for some time now, which is not supposed to be there by our enactment or laws. 
But, but have you uh, issued any yeah, statement? We, we have have been, my, people, my, my people have been here several times. They issue several notices. Notice upon notice on them. At the time you come, you don't even see the owner. At the time, by the time you come, they lock the gate. You cannot get access. And you can see how he was behaving there. But, but he, he explained when he was having an argument with you that he has not received any notice. No, that yeah, they have not been told he's, not, he's not telling the truth. We have issued notices upon notices to, to them. <laughs> Well, one interesting thing uh, we are realizing here is that a lot of people or a lot of residents are sort of living in fear because they are related to uh, the owners and so they are afraid to tell us what really is happening or they are afraid to even report to the AMO or the police to do something about the situation. They've been living in fear for years now, over 30 good years. There are wearing pigs here and the stench is very bad. How does that make you feel as you are selling Banku right by? my <laughs> Okay. Mm -hmm. So Auntie Joyce is telling us that they have been complaining for a while now but nothing is being done because they are sort of related to the owners of this place and this is affecting their business. Their customers complain of the stench when they buy their banquet to eat and so she's praying that the AMA could do something. We are going to court to take an order to close down the pista or they should relocate to a new place. A food premises and look at where they are preparing food for sale to the public. This seriously compromises food safety laws. So, you, so this is a food premises? Yeah, this is a food premises. You can see this is still for water or something. Look at the ground. The ground is not cemented. Look at those uh, detrimental articles there, the foul droppings. And this is the, 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 the fire or the oven hmm? and look at the the, the, the the roof you see so this food is not safe so the owner of this place is right by me and she doesn't see anything wrong with the situation here with bed droppings with the state of the roofing with the wood shavings and the dirt and the fact that the place is not cemented at all she doesn't see anything wrong with it she, she's telling uh, the AME that she she is going to clean the place when she's done but this has been a situation for a while now and I don't believe that she has been cleaning the place Patro yeah but so when him say, I didn't say, what clear and sana when you're Janino. Is that an answer? Yama way be brewa, me and no pano, ya ya watch any deco. Naya craha, and sana me ya shiton. In the after me ya shiton, me ya shiton, I'm a seer that the same is Siwana, Mudrihan. The public may think this food is saved for human consumption, but it's never saved. Because already in the kitchen, the food has been contaminated because the food is prepared in an insanitary condition before it is being transported from the house to this selling point. Okay, nine. So, so this is the kitchen in which uh, the food that we, we, we saw in the earlier dilapidated structure has been sold. And as you can see, it's quite neat and well uh, handled, but where the, the food is coming from, that's the source of the food, isn't in a good 
state. But, well, AMA officials have been speaking to the owner of this place, and she has, she has been pleading uh, for them to give her some time to still cook while she renovates the other structure. Well, the AMA is not having that, and so they, are, they have served her notice and are stopping her from cooking for one week until she uh, renovates the other structure. No, okay. Certificate up and work and that is for Joy Clean Ghana campaign. Still to come here on Joy News Prime, Nima's rugby girls will introduce to you the Zongo girls who have set the goal to be Ghana's first female rugby team. I wish to go far in rugby, we travel to countries, we go, we play, we score, we win a trophy. When I tell people that like, I play rugby league, they'll be like, ah, first girl like you are playing rugby. We have details of this and business for you. And in business, Ghana Coco Board together with the National Pensions Regulatory Authority inaugurates the Board of Trustees for the Coco Farmers Pension Scheme. The Employment Minister Ignatius Bafewa has this mandate for them. I've said that you are supposed to be independent. I don't want a situation where tomorrow we get up and there's a big tug of war between you and the sponsor of the scheme. Thanks for staying with us. And Charles Ayate is here with the latest in business. And Charles, almost a year after the vice president announced the uh, pension scheme for cocoa farmers, now we are going to see it happen. Exactly, especially with the inauguration of a new board of trustees that are going to make sure that the transition of funds to these cocoa farmers are done seamlessly. Take it away, Charles. Great. So we have all this as well as Alan Tremantin also inaugurating a board coming up in this segment of business with me, Charles Ayate. To our first story, as you know, the Ghana Cocoa Board together with the National Pensions Regulatory Authority has inaugurated a board of trustees of the Cocoa Farmers Pension Scheme. Swearing in the board, the Employment Minister Ignatius Bafuewa charged members of the independent to be independent and also put the interests of cocoa farmers first. It is good Cocoa Board is the one that is giving birth to this particular scheme, but after its birth, Cocoa Board's responsibility ends. Everything will be decided by the board of trustees. I, I wouldn't want to see Coco Board using the long hand trying to twist things there. You should be independent. That is not to say that you don't also go to the old man to seek advice. <laughs> <laughs> I have always found it very difficult and very challenging sometimes when I'm asked to make recommendations, um, especially in relation to persons that are going to be given positions of responsibility. Because I may know you, I may trust you for now, but I cannot trust you forever. Because under cert certain circumstances, your behavior may change. So sometimes when I'm asked to make recommendations, I find it difficult doing it. I'm saying so because you may have been recommended by your respective bodies to come and serve on this board. But please, let the trust they had in you before the recommendation was done stay. The Chief Executive of Cocoa Board, Emmanuel Ray Ankara, disclosed that Cocoa Board will commit 1% of its revenue to the Cocoa Pensions Fund. The thing is, yes, we have made a commitment to pay 1% of every cocoa sold by registered farmers into the scheme. And I'm waiting for the applause. And so I wish to indicate that this 1% will be done regularly. This is the covenant we have signed with our cocoa farmers and it's going to happen. We also have a team of financial experts that have already concluded on the permutations and calculations and have subsequently provided accurate projections which will enable us to prepare a realistic budget for the beneficiaries going forward. We will ensure that the funds are available to be transferred into the contributors' accounts without any hitch. We are going to ensure that. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, to conclude, through our policies and programs, we are changing the narrative about cocoa farming 
and making it lucrative for farmers and actors within the value chain. It is therefore our fervent hope to consolidate all these gains achieved over the past five years, four to five years, under the leadership of His Excellency, the President, and even to work harder to inject more funds. So you ain't seen nothing yet. This is just the beginning of what Cocoa Board and the government will do for the cocoa sector. Away from that, Trade Minister Alan Tremantin has charged members of the Ghana Enterprise Agency Board to maximize the gains from recent trade pacts, including the Ghana-European Union Interim Trade Agreement, to position small and medium-scale enterprises for global exports. According to him, the agency, a rebranding of the National Board for Small-Scale Industries, now has a policy framework to ensure its viability. Mr. Tremantin disclosed this when he inaugurated a 13-member governing board of the agency, with Sylvester Matthew Tete as board chairman. Government entrusted the management of this CAPBA scheme to the GA. So it means that with or without the transformation we are talking about, even if we just consider how we manage a post-COVID economic recovery program, it will not materialize without the support of an agency like the Ghana Enterprises Agency. But it also goes beyond that, because I'm sure by now you all realize that there are new market opportunities opening up for us in this country, around the continent in Africa, through the African Continental Free Trade Area after, but also through the new Ghana EU Interim Economic Partnership Agreement, which we are currently implementing since July 1st this year. So it means that we can now export duty-free, quota-free, literally all items except a few sensitive and exclusive products to one of the largest markets uh, in the world, which is the EU market. And again, because our enterprise base is predominantly small and medium enterprises, it is this agency that is going to lead the effort in us being able to harvest the benefits, not only of the AFCFTA, but also of the new economic partnership agreement. And that'll be all for business, but still to come in the bulletin, Nima's Rugby Girls will introduce you to the Zungu girls who have set the goal to be Ghana's first female rugby team. I wish to go far in rugby, we travel to countries, we go, we play, we score, we win a trophy. When I tell people that like, I play rugby league, they'll be like, ah, first girl like you are playing rugby. The man who sings his name is here in the studio to bring us the latest in sports, Hans Mensa. Do I sing my name? You do, Hans really? Mensa Ando. Okay. okay. I hear the cup first dentist in town. Yeah, Patrice Motsepe is in town to interact with the football community and be part um, of a youth summit that is, you know, ongoing in the country. But the president of the Confederation of African Football, Dr. Patrice Motsepe, he arrived in the country this morning for a two-day visit. The South African businessman arrived with his wife and son. They were met on arrival by the Minister of Youth and Sports, Mustafa Youssef, the President of the Ghana Football Association, Keto Kraku, and members of the Executive Council of the Ghana Football Association. Dr. Motsepe and his family called on His Excellency Dr. Mahamad Dubaumia at the Jubilee House. The South African businessman will meet President Nanado Dankwa Kofuado at a dinner event later in the evening to brainstorm on topics related to the development and forward marching of football on the African continent. The CAF boss will have a special session with Executive Council members, Youth and Sports Minister Mustafa Yusi, football stakeholders, corporate Ghana, past and present football administrators as well, will also be involved. And the media at the breakfast meeting at the Kempinski Hotel on Thursday. This is Dr. Patrice Motsepe's first visit to Ghana since he was elected into the office as president of the Confederation of African Football in March 2021. Let's get into some Division 1 talk and um, the ongoing National Division 1 
Super Cup has seen Sky FC booking a place in the final after beating Accra Lions this evening at the Medina Astro Tef. My colleague Oreko Ampofu was um, at the venue and comes through for Joy Sports. After 120 minutes, Sky FC and Accra Lions have finally been separated. It took just one goal and Sky FC got it in the first half of extra time. And what that means is that Sky FC would be joining Tema Youth in the final of the Maiden Division 1 League Super Cup. It was a good day of football. Earlier, Tema Youth went past some attacks by two goals to one. But this match was the one that a lot of people look forward to because Accra Lions did really have the mantle, especially for the promoted teams in the Premier League. And since they've been eliminated, it means that no side that was promoted to the Premier League would be in the final of the competition. Now, their head coach, that's Accra Lions, uh, he's a little bit disappointed with the performance and thinks that still this experience is good enough preparation for the new season ahead. Uh, it, is, it is disappointing um, because of the result. It's not disappointing the way we worked, we played, we fight it for two hours. I'm absolutely okay with uh, what I've seen. And after a very short time, I knew that who will make the first big mistake in this game, we lose it. Um, unlucky wise, it was us in the, in the additional time. Sky FC would be in the final facing opposition that they do know pretty well. They were in the same group with them in this Division 1 Super League. They drew 1-1, one, one, but their coach believes that this time they do have what it takes to be able to go past them and win the trophy. Of course, because we played them. We were in the same uh, group with them. Uh, we played our last match in the group and uh, we nearly made it. In fact, you know... Uh, there is this problem in our team, should I call it a problem? I, I would say is lack of experience on the part of some of the guys. Because the Tama Youth game, well, in the time I did one, I think it was five minutes added, and we played about three minutes or so. In fact, we let our guard down. A very silly, I say silly, silly. At least we could have protected that, but hey, it went in and it ended 1-1. And the way I saw them, nothing shows that we cannot beat them in the finals. I'm very optimistic we can beat them. So the final of the Maiden Division 1 League Super Cup would be between Tema Youth and then Sky FC. Both finished as runners-up for Tema Youth in Zone 3 and for Sky FC in Zone 2. We would find out who the champion of the first ever Division 1 League Super Cup would be come Saturday right here at the Medina Astrotef. Reporting for Joy Sports, Oreko Ampofu. That's it for now. More sports later in the bulletin. Let's not find out what's happening in the world of showbiz. KMJ's here. He has ordered the, uh, the gist. Mm -hmm. What's up, bro? I'm good. How, How are, you are you doing? I'm good, Charlie. Good yeah. day. What so do you have for us today? We, we've got stories on Kwame Eugene coming up and also uh, Rudy Kwache is advising Ghanaian musicians to be very selfish. We'll find out why he's saying that. Selfish? Yeah. Okay, we'll get there. But let's start with <laughs> Kwame Eugene. Eugene. Yeah. All right, so you know Kwame Eugene is signed on Lynx Entertainment. You know mm -hmm. a lot of people mm -hmm. have been on Lynx. You know, a couple of them have left. Yeah. Kwame and Kim. Miss B still, left. Miss B left, you know. Uh, yeah. Assem left. Assem left. And all of that. But the rapper, Maybell. How come I remember that? <laughs> easy, 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 easy. Okay, first the first lady. Yeah. Uh, she's also left. Now Kwame Eugene and Kitty is still there. Uh, Kwame Eugene was asked whether he's going to be leaving Lynx Entertainment in time. So he said no. I uh, was also quizzed whether he's going to be able to, you know, probably own the record label. And he said, well, it's expensive, but if our bets will be kind and Rich will be kind Doesn't enough, we reduce the price. Yeah. He might probably, you know, get it. Okay. He spoke on uh, Drive Time on Joy. Uh, let's have the details of that. Do you think you're ever going to leave? Um, uh, do you think you're ever going to leave Lynx Entertainment? I think so. I'll probably die and leave. <laughs> hey, that's the punchline. Man. That's the punchline. Please yeah. write it down for me. It's going straight on to myjoyonline.com. <laughs> so, you, so you think you're you're going to be there forever? I don't know, but <laughs> I love Links Entertainment. Mm. Maybe, maybe it will shock you guys. I'll, I'll have a baby and me and we should be going to PTA meetings. Together. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so does that also mean that well, it, it could happen that maybe sometime in the future you can own some shares with you know in it links and If he even sell links to me, I'll buy. It. Oh, but then if he sells it to you, then it means you're not working with him I anymore. I don't even have the money to buy it now. <laughs> but maybe one day. <laughs> yeah, I just love links so much, and mm. I think um, what it's really important is the relationship we have. Yeah. The fact that they've been able to, I mean. 
um, um, accept me as Eugene as I am mm -hmm. and being able to work with because I'm a stubborn guy. I'm really stubborn. Mm. I like for, to for do... For Dharma boy. Yes, I just <laughs> love to do what I think is good for me. Mm. And sometimes, maybe something will be good for me, but it's not good for Lynx. Mm -hmm. They have to... They have to maneuver their way around it to mm. make it i mean to explain to me that we have to do this first before this before oh well, then i understand i'm very stubborn but my level of comprehension is actually close i admit mm. it as i must say mm. once you can explain to me this is the reason why we are doing this i'm good mm. so mm. i think they've been able to put up with me for a very long time now mm. and i have to commend them for that shout out to links entertainment shout out to richie mensa he's a very good man and i appreciate wherever he's done i am right now because mm. He's the reason why I'm here. I appreciate him so much. And leaving links will be quite difficult. Mm. But I mean, I'm gentle on one mm. day, one day. Well, I, well, yeah. I, I agree. Maybe I'll be too old <laughs> to leave. <laughs> or maybe he will go like, oh, watch it. Go. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's an interesting one. Yeah, so you know, there's a song that is called One Day, One Day, Ube, One Day, One Day, Ube, Ube. Into One Day, One Day. Ube. There's always going to be a time, man. So, you would exit? Well, let's see how it goes. Okay. Anyway, so let's talk about Ghanaian music. And, uh, you know, uh, the CEO of Rave Group, uh, Rudy Kwache, mm -hmm. has said that uh, it is proper for all musicians to be very selfish, highly selfish, because the likes of Jay-Z have all been selfish in life one way or the other, and that's why they've been successful. And until Ghanaian musicians actually learn how to be selfish, they would never be successful. Yes, more. My point is there's an expert and a player and everybody gets paid for their services. Let creatives stop for once, for 10 seconds. About it, and I know creatives actually to be successful have to be highly selfish. Yeah. And, it's, it's, and it's okay, it's perfectly okay. Mm -hmm. Like, if you meet a talent that is not selfish, walk away, that guy can't succeed. They need that selfishness too, but there's a way to apply that. If you do not recognize that there's a chain and a complex and a people, whatnot. I'm a business person. I've signed to an accounting firm that is doing my numbers. I have hired a business strategist. Like, I literally go through that cycle just so that I can improve. Because if I'm looking for that big luchi, I have to structure myself well. Let us stop telling the guy, oh, you are supposed, you are not supposed to be anything. Success requires without bigs right there will not be jay-z bigs has been the business architect from rockaware through to what uh, what their business is right now find yours it is not by fluke that beyonce is doing the things that she does because when the made in america tour was happening there was a gentleman who was head of sponsorships and marketing at chase bank he oversaw and did the whole deal right after that tour that guy quits the bank and takes over Parkwood Entertainment. Obviously. <laughs> he didn't come because Beyonce get big behind. Yeah. Let's not get it twisted. So if you require brains, you have must trade. If you hire a top lawyer, there are lawyers in Ghana. And then there are lawyers in Ghana. If you want a lawyer in Ghana, <laughs> you, you know for know pay. It boils down to investing in yeah. your, your art. Yeah, very, very your craft. Very yep. And also making sure that you, you get the best out yeah. of it. The highlight for me is there are lawyers in Ghana. And there are lawyers in Ghana. There are musicians in Ghana. On that note. And there are musicians in Ghana. <laughs> on that note. There are bulletins in Ghana. And there are bulletins. And it's a Tony's bulletin. You know what I'm saying? That's See you, my right. brother. That's, thank you. Thank you very much. That's KMJ. We bring us the latest in the world of showbiz. We have more stories for you. Stay with us. Thanks for staying with us here on Join News Prime. Now, President Okufado has reiterated his resolve to ensure reliable, stable power supply in the country, saying electricity must be seen as a basic necessity enjoyed by Ghanaians everywhere. He's convinced ongoing improvement in power supply will permanently erase Dumso from the Ghanaian society, commissioning the 330 kilovolts of power at the Pukwase bulk supply point estimated at $47 million. The president said government's quest to develop the country through industrialization will not succeed if electricity supply is not guaranteed. A project which not only gives us the assurance of stable power supply, but also reminds us of how far we have come from the days of widespread power outages and the phenomenon of Dumso, which brought us so much discomfort and inconvenience and brought businesses to their knees. Those were truly dark days.
literally speaking, and we must continue to keep them behind us. Ladies and gentlemen, any country that aspires to industrialize with the overarching goal of guaranteeing a decent quality of life for its people must ensure that its citizens have access to stable, efficient, and affordable power supply. Electricity is no longer a luxury, but rather in this age, a basic necessity. And we must commit our, ourselves to working hard to ensure that we achieve universal coverage in this country as soon as possible to spur economic growth. The Akufuado government remains fully committed to ensuring safe, stable, and affordable power supply in this country. As we focus on realizing the Ghana Beyond the Date agenda, which has industrialization as its crown jewel, it is imperative that we pursue this goal with dog determination to help ensure that every nook and country of this country has access to electricity as soon as possible as the main driver of our vision. I'm confident that we are on the right path and with God on our side, I believe strongly that we should succeed in this enterprise. The project funded by the United States government through the Millennium Development Authority is the largest in the country. Deputy Energy Minister Dr. Amin Adam said though there are challenges, the ministry is working to ensure a resilient power sector. It is a proud achievement that will no doubt bring so much relief to consumers within East Catchment area. But beyond Pokwazi, I am also happy to report that the Kasua bulk supply point project is finalized, providing further assurances of stable and reliable power supply to consumers. Across board, in the power generation, transmission, and distribution areas, we are working hard to ensure synergy between the three, and this project is ample testimony of the work we are doing to develop the linkages between these three sectors so we can prevent technical and financial losses and to ensure that challenges such as power theft are eliminated or cut down to the barest minimum. Negotiations on power purchase agreements with the independent power producers are also underway to ensure the taxpayer gets value for money. In renewable energy, ladies and gentlemen, we continue to make strides towards ensuring viability in our energy mix, whilst ensuring that the integrity of our environment is preserved. The United States Ambassador to Ghana, Stephanie Sullivan, says her country will continue to partner Ghana to keep the lights on. These are long-term investments that will pay dividends for generations. And that is the real beauty of what this grand substation is about. It is about inclusively helping ordinary Ghanaian citizens go about their daily lives with fewer interruptions. Students can study with the lights on in the evening. Store owners' products can last longer and are safer with continuous refrigeration. Drivers can safely navigate illuminated streets at twilight. Babies can sleep peacefully under a treated bed net, I trust, through the hot, humid night under the soft blow of a fan. And indeed, we're lucky to have the fans here today because it is a warm day, but no power shortage. The power sector is a complex system of customers, government entities, and private businesses. But to any Ghanaian, it is simple. Unreliable electricity leaves us all in the dark. This project keeps the lights on. As part of the $316 million MCC Ghana Power Compact, which is just one of the US government's many contributions to a brighter future for Ghana. 
This substation is just one of multiple investments under the MCC Ghana Power Compact. Major construction will be completed in the coming months on substations at Kanda, Legon, and Kasawa, which are also designated to design to improve the quality and reliability of electricity through reduced outages and technical losses. Government says residents of Adan West must bury their differences and rally behind the Songo Salt Mining Project. Businessman Daniel McCauley is leading a project geared at turning the Songo Salt Lagoon into the largest salt mining mine in Africa. The project has, however, been met with stiff opposition from some locals who say the 15-year lease granted Mr. McCauley's Electrochem Ghana Limited will not be beneficial to them. Lantern Natural Resources Minister Samuel Abujinapo on Wednesday led a government delegation to visit the area as well as inspecting some other projects. There's more on the following report. The minister's thought took off at the modern dairy farms. Government is seeking to compensate owners of more than 1,300 acres of land to undertake an affordable housing project. We have a whole plan which is eventually, God willing, with the approval of the President of the Republic, will result in the Ministry of Works and Housing having access to some uh, good land and which will help with um, the very ambitious program of the Minister for Works and Housing to develop affordable housing in our country. Affordable housing is very dear to the President and he's, 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 he's giving the express instructions and he's very eager that we develop affordable housing schemes in our country to help with the housing of public officials, public servants, and so on and so on. My understanding and my briefing is that we have some 1,381 acres of land here. And there's a proposal for us to release part of that land to the families, to the Amaria family. And part of it is going to be for the farm, and part of it is going to be freed up for affordable housing. Uh, I think we can be uh, a bit about it and work hard to bring closure to this plan and this proposal. He then visited a Songo Lagoon salt mine. Electrochem Ghana Limited, a company owned by the Magdan Group of Companies, has been permitted to mine in the area. Some residents have been expressing concerns about being rendered jobless. Group chairman of Magdan Group of Companies, Daniel McCauley, has been explaining his vision for the area. Almost everybody doubted us. Almost everybody doubted us. Here we are today. And um, we need not say much. But it's for your eyes only. We are here for my people and the people of Adan. And as I keep saying always, this project is for the people. This project is people's project. And I am just the Moses who is taking Adan to the promised land. Lands and Natural Resources Minister Samuel Abujinapo urged the residents to embrace the project. They've been enormous investment into the exploitation of this resource. And what we have seen today is contributing to the economy of Ada, is contributing to the economy of Greater Accra, and by, undoubtedly is contributing to the economy of Ghana. And the future for this project is highly, highly uh, you know, promising. I mean, we're going to see a lot of linkages. We're going to see a lot of derivatives out of these operations and this um, effort by Mr. McDan. So, Dr. McCauley, congratulations and we thank you, commend you highly for this work. Excellent work done. And this is why the people of Ada and government should support these operations. I know, and I have to mention this, that when such good things are happening, there will normally and always be a minority, a tiny few, who will try to torpedo the effort and who will try to come and say all kinds of things. So, but in any event, the man behind this operation is right from here. He's one of your own. He's your king's man. So what you want for yourself and whatever good you want for yourself, he wants even more for the people of Adan. The traditional authorities pledge their support. Um, the previous speakers spoke about peace, which is required for Songo to actualize. That is very true. JJ has done all that has to be done to make sure that there is peace in Ada. We know that a few, one, two, three, or four persons may not like 
you cannot get every body to say yes sometimes. But at least the greatest majority of the people of Adan are behind this project. And we cannot wait to see the fruits of um, the Songo Lagoon investment. There's an increase in rape and armed robbery attacks in the community of Subule in the Kintempo community of the Bono East region. Recent torrential rains in the area have washed away parts of the road uh, network linking the community to Kintempo. The incident, according to residents and the chief of the area, Nana Abobrim Yao Dompo II, has led to an increase in criminal activities there. Correspondent Nasa Bits visited the community and has come through with this report. Right, so this afternoon we are here in the Kintampo South District of the Bono East Region. The situation here is that uh, this portion of the road linking Sabule and uh, Tandigne through to the Kintampo uh, Municipality has been washed away. Parts of this road has been washed away after torrential uh, rainfall somewhere last month. And since then, vehicles do not uh, cross this part of the uh, road because obviously there's no access to the other side of the um, uh, municipality and uh, the people here tell me the situation is affecting them in terms of their economic, uh, health and then educational you know, activities. Uh, so you shall say two months in you. Say over free her aqua can tampo. How can say part the mile? We've been in this situation for the past two months. Crossing this river to Kintampo is a huge problem for us because vehicles cannot cross this river. We go to the Kintampo market on Wednesdays and traders would have to pick an extra vehicle to get to the market. See the water level now. The situation has even improved. Yeah, yeah, business wa ha me me to mpa no me de pa no be say amasa this am be dru ha na me gina those of us in the trees are really suffering moto ya so wa mrante be say time na na eight my motorbike has to be lifted by about seven or eight people and i have to pay them five Ghana cities for that and two cities for the bread at the end i spend the little profit i get on this so we are into a big problem the person is a Tianum. Yes, we are school for Suanum. Teachers in Pa. If you can tapobet and credit Pompa, I had him. We have school children here, and the teachers who move from Kintampo to teach here are not able to come, especially when it rains. So it's a huge challenge for us all, both adults and children. So we are appealing to those in authority to please come to our aid. On the animation of Omra Mabway, now, uh, the people here who are predominantly farmers have their uh, farm produce stuck in here because vehicles cannot get into their farms to convey their farm produce to the market. And this is uh, actually a sort of worry for them economically because um, most of their farm produce are currently going waste because of the current situation. Yeah, yeah, we are for her. Since we had our yam festival, we've not been able to send our harvest to the market, and as a result, our produce are going waste. On health, <laughs> people, especially pregnant women who are referred to the Kintampo government hospital, do not have the means to get there because when they get here they have to be lifted carried uh, by young men here and then cross over to the other side that is if there is a vehicle to convey uh, her to the hospital while sending a pregnant woman to the Kintampo government hospital, we have to carry her on our shoulders to cross this river before making another arrangement to get another vehicle. So it's a huge problem for us all. Chief of Sabule and acting president of the more traditional council, Nana Abubrim Yao Dumpo II, laments that armed robbers have taken advantage of the situation to rob residents of their valuables. These armed robbers are here. They capitalize on the flood be by the size of the river 
And then when you are coming, they stop you, they rob you, and sometimes uh, even, even kill. You see, women, they sex them, which is abnormal, which is, hit, which is not good. So we, we plead with the government to help us put up a bridge. In a related development, motorists and commuters were left stranded for several hours as a downpour on Tuesday evening forced several parts of the Ashanti region to flood. The floods caused heavy vehicular traffic and rendered sections of the road inaccessible. My colleague Ohimin Teria reports residential, commercial and religious places were inundated by floodwaters. <laughs> Over three hours of continuous downpour caused River Susan, Owabe, Subin, and other tributaries to overflow their banks. As Okwe Mampong Sepetimpom, Kumasi Barakase of Finsu Rose, among places were blocked for several hours as they were taken over by flood waters. Motorists and commuters were trapped for several hours amidst heavy vehicular traffic. Vehicles, including this Toyota Camry and tricycles, were swept away by the flood waters, trapping occupants on board. The vehicle was just something tiny for the force of the water. In the Asokoremampo municipality, a brave young man rescued five people trapped in a Toyota Camry vehicle, swept away by flood waters at Asabi Junction. The occupants could not even remove the ignition key. It is left in the vehicle. My brother, would you even bother to think of your key once you have been carried away from the main road to this part? I believe by that point, all that they were thinking about is them dying. But with God's help, the guy was able to come in to open and got those guys out. The exact spot recorded six flood-related deaths about two years ago. Assemblyman for Sepetimpom, Kwame Nkrumah Atta, is full of praise to Mr. Abedi for that life-saving intervention. About three years ago, there were containers all over, and we experienced such floods, and uh, six people died around this area. Those who were commuting from the uh, central market to their Various as we also lock up here. So the, those guys who were here managed to uh, tie a rope around Mohammed Abidi, and he, it was sheer bravery that made the guy came over here to rescue those guys that were trapped in the vehicle. Mm. I don't know how, what came over the guy, but he had just saved us from another calamity. It was later on that the fire service came, but by the time they came, the rescue activity had been completed. We've always recommended that during the dry season, the river should be dredged. Some time passed, there was this dredging activity that were being carried out on the river, and we didn't experience this kind of flooding. So once I believe that the, we must continue with the dredging, so that uh, when it's rainy season, there will be enough space for the waters to flow through. Some residents stayed awake overnight to clear their rooms filled with water. It is already 2 a.m. on Wednesday. Sawaba New Site is one of the communities inundated by flood waters. In this house, I have seen some of the residents trying to clean their rooms, which have been taken over by flood waters. Hello, good morning. Good morning, boys. What is happening here? When I get home, my room was flooded, so I'm trying my possible best to see. Let's return to Accra and some students of the University of Ghana say they are worried about the deployment of national security personnel uh, to their campus for the SRC elections. Many of them say they are comfortable with police presence but not national security operatives. The students point to the Yawas West work on election violence as the reason for the fear. Various social media platforms of students are watched with pictures of men alleged to be uh, from the national security. Maxwell Ababa has more. I'll just say that for a mere election, like a student representative council election, the police had um, the capacity, has the capacity to handle it, and there's no need for the national security to be present here. You know, the presence of the national security here is quite appalling. 
appalling in the sense that this is an intellectual environment and an election is being conducted for those intellectuals. So there's no way elections here will result in violence. But the only thing that I suspect, which is why they, they are here, is that there are some candidates here, one or two, who are affiliated with the current administration, I mean the MPP. That is why they have been deployed to this place to intimidate students. Their presence alone will create some problems or nervousness for some students to even get out to vote because they are national security. All of a sudden, I can see national security all over. But my intelligence or my knowledge about national security, where there is uh, some difficulties in terms of violence, uh, conflict, that's where they come in. They are, they, 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 they are set down to come and solve situations. But here, like the case, we are doing our election in a smooth environment, in a very good uh, 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 manner. So why, why, why should they be at the first place? I've also been speaking to the NDC's 2020 parliamentary candidate um, for the Yaraso West Wagon constituency, John Domelo. Fortunate that, I mean, the national security uh, personnel are here, or some of them are here. I mean, I don't know why they're going to be on campus, you know. This is an SRC election, it's an internal election. Um, I mean, uh, going by what, how the day started, I mean, it's, it's been peaceful so far. I mean, you have the, um, I believe, the East Legon um, policemen around, and so they are maintaining law and order, so I don't see why national security should be should be here. Let's go through the whole process. I, I feel that their presence here is just an act of intimidation, just to intimidate some group of people, just to, you know, show that, oh, you know, they are here and all that. But totally unnecessary. I mean, they, can, they could have stayed off somewhere. I mean, just be off campus. I mean, this is Legon campus. Be at Okonglo, be at Shashi somewhere. If something happens, you rush here, and then you you come you, you you call everything down. But I think it's totally unnecessary that they're here. Okay, okay. Any message for um, the students? I can see you interacting with some of them. That, well, that, yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm just here to monitor, you know, how the SRC elections are going, and um, you know, just to see that uh, the right candidate wins. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's about it. I, I used to eye I also West were gone <laughs> in 2024. I've had suggestions of other places. You have? <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I've had other places in the voter region or something. Oh, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> no, don't worry. Our main focus now is that 2024, we, we make John Mahama the president. I've been speaking to the director of public affairs um, at the University of Ghana. Um, she has been responding to some of the issues raised. So I don't agree with this submission made by students. Mm -hmm. I am thinking of, we, you know, when there are elections, mm -hmm. we have security around, the university security is around, they are, they've dispatched their men to the various centers yeah. to ensure that everything goes on well. Anything can happen when there is elec election. They are not just around to intimidate, I'm talking about our university security. Mm -hmm. So they are not just around, they are not around to intimidate mm -hmm. anybody. But they are there so that if anything happens, somebody can collapse, anything can happen. Mm -hmm. So that they are able to call at the appropriate offices to take care. And they are working together with our Dean of Student Affairs. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine, management is on board. We have the police also supporting. Mm -hmm. So just as it's done at the national level, they are helping to keep calm so that everything goes on well. And then at the end of the day, we'll have successful elections at the student front. Mm. Mm. But some of them who are raising the concerns um, cite the uh, violence at the US West to work on where we had a national security present and then there was um, chaos and all of that and violence um, happened there. That's what um, they are referencing. Yeah, so far they've gone far in their elections and we haven't heard of any violence, we haven't heard of any problem. Ghana doesn't yet have a female team for rugby league one of the world's most followed sports. In Nima, a Zongo suburb of Accra, young Muslim girls are hoping to be part of the first players to make it into a female rugby team to be formed. In a largely conservative community where females face several hurdles uh, pursuing a career in sports, their journey is one of hope and also uncertainty. John is Justice Baden. Went to meet some of them. Help! Scrum! Set! Girls, hijab, and rugby. Quite an unusual mix. But here in Nima, these players are the poster girls for a future female rugby team in Ghana. 
This is a red earth park at Kaukudi Junction in one of Ghana's largest Muslim suburbs. I'm Aida Amino. I was born at Mamobi. Last try. Aida Amino, 22 years old, lives in the slum and wants to make it into Ghana's first national rugby team for women. She studied catering in school and is unemployed now. But she is a talented rugby player. Rugby is a nice game for my community. Muslims, when they see you going to training, ah, where are you going? They see you, ah, as a lady, you have to be at home helping mother or doing some house chores, but you are going to, you are saying you are going to, what are you going to do? Like, for Uncle see baby, so, and I said, they will say, Sports in Africa, like Ghana here, won't take you to anywhere. So my friend, just stop and find yourself doing something. Knock on, green ball. Rugby is a very, very physical game to play. And in Ghana, the sport is not even very popular relatively. If you live in a place like Nima, the pitches to play on are not even available. And if you are a girl in a very, very conservative area like this, there are even more hurdles to leap if you want to get onto the big stage. Like her, many girls in inner cities like Nima face a glass ceiling on their way up. When I tell people that like, I play rugby league, they'll be like, ah, first girl like you are playing rugby. So you would be like, ah, I'm going to be This team is barely a year old, but it's already drawing many girls from far and near. Turn over! Rugby is a 15-a-side team sport. Knock on! Turn over! To score, a player must ground the ball behind an opponent's try line Turn over. into what is called the in-goal area. Unlike football, it is played with both the hand and the leg. A lot of the girls in the Zongo communities are already involved in one sporting activity or the other. We are looking forward to getting to the international level, but then we are taking baby steps. So we started with um, touch, we started with tag, now we've been initiated into contact rugby so we can play full contact games. So the next steps are to take coaching and officiating courses, then we'll play um, more competitive, we'll recruit more ladies and play more competitively at club levels, then we can proceed to form our own national team. Like Aida, many of the girls in Nima hope to shatter the glass ceiling, hoping they are baby steps here will be the needed springboard. One, touch one. Justice Beidou, Joy News, Nima. This is Joy News Prime. My name is Ernest Mini. We're taking a break on we return. Charles IT will bring us business. Stay with us. And we're back with business. A 30-member delegation of entrepreneurs from Rwanda is on a business tour in Ghana in preparation for the Youth Connect Africa Summit, which is being hosted in the country. The Director for Investor Services Division at the Ghana Investment Promotion Centre, Edward Ashon Latte, addressing the team at a business-to-business -business meeting ahead of the summit, says the meeting was to offer the right orientation for entrepreneurs to be able to network and make the most out of the business opportunities in Ghana. The government of Rwanda has successfully fashioned an institutional framework that is fully consistent with what most economists claim should be conducive to entrepreneurship. The trip to Ghana is part of the government's strategy to empower young entrepreneurs to explore intra-African trade on the African continent. Here is Rwandan High Commissioner, Her Excellency Dr. Isa Kirabo, addressing the delegation. We are here to just really thank and congratulate you, our young people. You very well know that our leaders have not only committed themselves in word, but in deed to, to support young people, to take the center stage and leadership in the economic and social transformation of our countries. I'm very delighted that the dream of our president, His Excellency President Paul Kagame, with his brother, His Excellency President Nana Akufo Ado, on establishing FCTA is now being realized. We hope that as you discuss, you realize that actually the decisions you make, 
the way you take the risk to follow through, the barriers you break, whatever you see as a challenge, getting back to us to tell us what we can do to make it do for you, happen for you, is actually what's going to make AFCT realized. Director for Investor Services Division at the Ghana Investment Promotion Center, Edward Ashonglati, outlined various avenues of exploration for Rwandans in Ghana. The incentives that are outlined in my presentation are also for both Ghanaian and foreign-owned businesses. And at this seminar, we encourage the participants to take advantage of each other's presence here to explore various types of um, collaboration. I mean, we have this big delegation from Rwanda, and so the least that we can do is to open up and engage them. Now, traders at the Kunka market in the Boise municipality of the Shanti region have bemoaned low patronage of goods at the market. They blame the slow business on the poor road network there and inactive lower terminal at the market as well. Now, the traders are appealing to government and stakeholders to double the efforts in reviving the market. Anita Sewa Ajuga filed this report. The Kunka market, which was commissioned in January 2018, is empty as most of the traders have left their stalls to sell on the streets. Ekuya Safoa, a trader at the market, laments her food items rot away due to low patronage. This, she says, has affected her profit and is unable to pay for loans taken from the bank. Oh, first, you be a friend and you are a friend. Business was good when the market was first opened, but not these days. The authorities have turned a blind eye on us. We go for loans to work and we are unable to repay them. The few traders who sell at the market want authorities to take immediate measures to make the market attractive. We were initially here with some public transport drivers, but they have left us. They say the road leading to the market is bad, so they've all moved to the roadside. We beg the authorities to help us so people can buy from us. They should direct vehicles traveling to the rural areas to come here to load their vehicles so people can buy from us. According to the municipal transport officer, the various transport unions in the municipality have been engaged to revive the lorry terminal at the market. Engineer Scott Nkrumah is the Obwasi municipal transport officer. We are this time going to involve more transport unions so that there will be much competition. You that you think that you because of A or B you cannot work, the other person will be ready to work with us. Currently we have, we've written a letter to all the villages that here will be their last stop. So we are waiting for our MCD to come and endorse that letter so that that letter can go to them for implementation. The municipal coordinating director has outlined plans to activate the Kunka market and lorry terminal at Obwasi. Francis Dradaku assured traders the situation will be resolved in a month's time. The road from the other side to the market too was no good and the road from the other communities too. So the road has been now been awarded on contract and when the road is fixed, we will make sure that the market becomes vibrant. Uh, in about a month's time, we, we, we work on that because we are meeting with the transport unions to make sure that they bring uh, the uh, bigger vehicles, the taxis, and I mean to uh, take the people from town to here and from the, the various communities to the market. Road contractors have also promised the bad road network will be fixed before Christmas. Job Osaitutu is the CEO of Jobust Company. We are working together to make sure before Christmas we can put up a good trade fair over here to activate the place to make sure the place is active and working. And we, we are also entreating management, municipal assembly, people who can do the doing 
to do well to bring the rural force cars over here so that those trucks, those cars, as soon as they come, they offload their goods, then people will come and buy from here. Anita Sewa, Ajigas Report, read to you. That'll be all for business, but I will leave you with international business news, after which we do have sports. I'm Charles IIT. Many thanks for watching. President of the Ghana Football Association, Keto Kroko, has admonished the elite referees to be professional in their dealings and work hard to bring Ghana back to where we belong in the football ecosystem. He says his administration will continue to invest in referees to make the profession attractive and lucrative. President Simon Okroko um, said this when he visited the elite referees at the Ghana Man Center Soccer of Excellence at Pom Pom during um, their training ahead of the 2021-2022 season that kicks off on Friday, October 29. Now, President of the Ghana Basketball Association, David Ashon, has revealed to Joy Sports that the state lacks resources to support a national basketball team. Basketball has been active at the regional and tertiary level with the University of Ghana basketball team um, among the leading, one of the leading basketball teams on the continent. Now, however, there has been a gap at the national team level and he says the game is suffering from the least financed sports conundrum. Uh, I'm, uh, it's interesting you say that. I mean, you have two th different things happening. At first, we did have a national team, uh, which was a bit more active because we had support. And at the time, there was less grassroots participation in basketball. I think the situation has reversed. Mm -hmm. You have more at the grassroots and less at the top. And I think there are good reasons or clear reasons for that. When it gets to the national team, it's a matter of sponsorship. It's a matter of, and to a large extent, when it's national rather than commercial, it's the state which has to give the resources. And it's much more difficult to attract sponsorship at that level. And government has its constraints, focuses on us. I mean, it's, it's something you hear all the time talking about the lesser known sports, et cetera, et cetera. And basketball is a victim of that as well. So we've had a reversal. And I think personally, I'm glad that um, we have basketball being played across the country. Sprite ball has been a wonderful addition to um, the sport in this country. And other tournaments, uh, at, and we have regional leagues being played. And so there's a lot going on, on the ground. But the kind of visibility people want to see is a national team. Let's get into the UEFA Champions League and bring you some of the updates, some of the results that have come through today. Barca beating Dynamo Kiev by a goal to nil. Also Benfica um, as well losing at home four goals to nil against Bayern Munich. 90 minutes done at Old Trafford. Manchester United um, winning by three goals to two against Atalanta. And then Young Boys also at home losing by four goals to one against um, Villarreal. Salzburg um, earlier beating Wolfsburg by um, three goals to one. And then Lille and Sevilla playing, you know, goalless drawn game. Um, Chelsea hitting Malmo for four. Four goals to nil. Chelsea winning that game. And um, Zenit St. Petersburg um, also um, as well involved Tonight, losing by a goal to nil against Juventus. Also, action from the UEFA Europa League. And, of course, um, there is Sparta Moscow who lost by three goals to four against Leicester City. Patson Dakar 
is the name on everyone's lip because he scored four goals in this game, including um, less than 10 minutes hat trick in that game. So, of course, we'll expand on the developments in the UEFA Champions League um, a bit more later tonight on Fanzone. Do make a date. In the meantime, you can read more sports at myjoyonline.com forward slash sports and Hans Mainsando. Many thanks for your time. Many thanks for your company. For today's bulletin, you can find more stories when you log on to myjoyonline.com. I'm Ernest Min. Thank you.